Hello, everybody. How about that jazzy start, the new start to our for our sponsor video? My name is Astrid Bennett. I'm the board co-chair and events committee chair of Surface Design Association, a nonprofit focused on contemporary fiber and textile art. We have a special treat for you today with this week's textile talk. Identity is expansive, a conversation with Michael Sylvan Robinson and Elisa Author from the Museum of Arts and Design. Textile Talk webinars are brought to you by the International Quilt Museum, Quilt Alliance, Studio Art Quilt Associates, and Surface Design Association. First, a few housekeeping announcements. This is a webinar. Your screens and mics are not active or showing. We welcome questions. They will be addressed at the end of the presentation. Please submit them in the Q&A box and located at the bottom of your screen. We are honored to bring you free and inspiring Textile Talks programming. We respectfully ask you to be courteous as you engage with speakers, moderators, and other participants. Your chat comments can be seen by everyone. Please use the Q&A for questions chat box for greeting others and survey for commentaries or ways we can improve. Um, and now I'd like to introduce Elisa Author, our moderator for today. Uh, Elisa is Deputy Director of Curatorial Affairs and the William and Mildred Lads Lasden Chief Curator at the Museum of Arts and Design, also known as MAD, in New York City. She provides the strategic direction and creative oversight for exhibitions, publications, and exhibition-related public programming. She has published widely on the history of modernism and its relationship to craft and the decorative, the material culture of American cult counterculture, and feminist art. Her book, String, Felt, Thread, The Hierarchy of Art and Craft in American Art, focuses on the broad utilization of fiber in art of the 1960s and 70s, and the changing hierarchical relationship between art and craft in that period. Her exhibitions include West of Center, Art and the Counterculture Experiment in America, 1965 to 1977, Pretty slash Dirty, Marilyn Minter, Senga Negudi, Im Improvisational Gestures, surface, surface Depth, The Decorative After Miriam Shapiro, and Queer Maximalism and Machine Dazzle, which was the focus of a textile talk last week. Alisa, welcome. Thank you, Astrid. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, I'm honored to be here, and it's a real pleasure to introduce now Michael Sylvan Robinson, who goes by Sylvan. Sylvan is an internationally exhibited genderqueer fiber artist, activist, and leader in arts education. They earned an MFA in interdisciplinary arts from Goddard College in 2008 and a BA from Bennington College in 1989 with an emphasis in dance and drama. With a background in costume design and as a performance artist, their contemporary fiber art has been shown in galleries and museum exhibitions, including Rome Art Week, Spring Art Show, or sorry, Spring Break Art Show, which is a, a big fair here in New York City, the National Queer Arts Festival in San Francisco, and the Wisconsin Museum of Quilts and Fiber Arts. Sylvan's fashion art was photographed by Vogue Germany, um, uh, and recently, there's what we're going to talk a little bit about is a commission um, that was made for uh, the theater producer and fashion enthusiast Jordan Roth for the Met Gala in 2021. Um, I think that's the piece that was photographed for Vogue Germany, um, if I'm not mistaken, Sylvan. Um, it also appeared in an interview for Vogue and Vogue France, and there was a wonderful profile in the print magazine and digital version. Sylvan has been interviewed on fashion and art activism on the podcast Dressed, The History of Fashion, fantastic segment that I listened to recently. And he's currently exhibiting this coat um, that was made for Jordan Roth and is titled Identity Is um, at the Museum of Arts and Design. 
and that will be up through June. And I want to say a little bit about um, MAD's history, just to give you some context of why um, it was so important for me to bring the coat uh, to the museum and why I think it's the perfect fit. So for those of you who don't know, MAD was founded in 1956 to advocate for artists working in the underrepresented craft mediums of glass, fiber, ceramics, and wood, and then also the disciplines of furniture, jewelry, and textile design, and, and fashion design as well. You see on the left our founder, oh wait, go back, our founder, that's Aileen Osborne Webb, um, pictured here in 1956. Um, she had already been a, a advocate for the crafts for many, many years and then founded the museum, which was located in the 50s, um, 60s, 70s, and into the 1980s um, on the same street as MoMA, 53rd, 53rd Street. So in, in this period, and you see one of the early locations on 53rd Street on the right-hand side, MAD was called the Museum of Contemporary Crafts. Um, and in the 1980s, it went through a name change, and then again in 2002, renamed as the Museum of Arts and Design. You could go forward, um, Sylvan. I also want to mention the prominence of fiber-related um, exhibitions to MAD's mission um, since its founding. It's uh, a, a part of the earliest exhibitions um, uh, history of the institution and continues to be very, very strong um, in our exhibition vision and programming. And then if you go to the next slide, these are just two examples of shows that were at MAD. And here I'm showing you our location since 2008 when it moved from 53rd Street location to Columbus Circle. On the left-hand side, um, you see the original building um, that was uh, designed by the great American architect, Edward Durrell Stone. And then on the right hand side, it's refurbishment for the Museum of Arts and Design. So that name change um, had been uh, executed slightly before the move to Columbus Circle. So today, MAD continues its mission to support artists working in craft and design um, in a contemporary art world that still harbors a bias um, against craft and the handmade, but that's changed rapidly. So we are um, always sort of moving and, and redirecting ourselves to now to a contemporary art world where artists can move um, more comfortably between the art, craft, and design divide. I think Sylvan's a very good example of that. Um, our collection continues to grow. It is modest in size compared to most uh, New York um, institutions, art institutions. We have about 3,500 objects. Um, fiber is a a real powerhouse of the collection. It has been since our founding, as I mentioned, and it continues, um, the diversity of the co collection continues to grow, um, especially with um, the way the handmade has become a very prominent part of visual culture and creative production in the queer community. And of course, Sylvan is um, a superstar in that community. And it's just an incredible pleasure to have him um, highlighted in the institution because his work very much reflects uh, the mission and the continued vision um, for the institution. So thank you, Sylvan, for helping us realize this wonderful um, installation with this coat that was commissioned by Jordan Roth. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much, Elisa. And it's great to be here again at a Textile Talk. I'm also a member of the Board of Directors for Service Design Association, where I serve on the AEI committee. Uh, and I'm a big fan of MAD and, and honored and thrilled to have a chance to share about this special installation. Oops, suddenly it doesn't want to go forward. There, there we go. go. Uh, so uh, mostly we're going to talk a little bit about this commission uh, that, that I was able to do in 2021 for, for Jordan Roth, a theater producer and a fashionista extraordinaire. Uh, and it's an un, it was a little bit of an unlikely arrival for me. I, I, I don't run a fashion house. I'm not necessarily the kind of person who someone calls and says, we'd like you to do a Met Gala uh, commission. But I was in this sort of post-pandemic arrival. Uh, currently, the, the coat is on display in the lobby uh, in a beautiful installation, which we'll talk a little bit more at the end of the talk today. Uh, but it is really an opportunity to showcase um, this exquisite work uh, that obviously, unless you were a guest at the Met Gala in 2021, and that 
odd September gala, uh, you didn't get to see it live. I uh, said so that many, many, many people at MAD will be able to chance to get to look at it close up and see all the extensive detail. Uh, the entire surface of the garment is all entirely uh, attached by hand, embroidery, beading, sequining. Uh, so Jordan's vision for this garment was really around the idea of identity as a construction, a construction that one is both kind of constantly readjusting, weaving and unweaving, changing and transforming, uh, and came to uh, propose a, a garment that would express that. Uh, and particularly, this is the, the gala that comes out of that front end of the pandemic. Uh, and so there was kind of an odd time to be considering you know, a large event still at this point. Uh, and I think that some of the reasons that we matched so well was this idea of, of bringing some of my queer activism to a garment that would then be arriving at a very particular moment. Uh, here's a little bit of the extensive details and a close up. Well, how did I get here? Uh, originally, I had created a garment called Priestessing the Work of Healing, a very personal garment uh, shown on the right. And it was a garment that I made during the front end of the pandemic. And Guinevere Vancinas, the model and now photographer, uh, reached out and said she'd like to include it in a photo shoot. Uh, and I dropped the garment off thinking that it would never really end up in the, in the shoot in the end, but it was worn by Saskia de Brau uh, in, in Vogue, Germany, uh, styled by Michael Fillos. And this garment uh, and the full page spread really opened the door. Uh, I will say that as someone who used to collect fashion magazines to collage and for inspiration, particularly in my early New York days of the 80s and 90s, the idea that my work would show up in a fashion magazine like this had really never been a dream that I thought I could achieve. Uh, but this moment really opened a, a different audience. Here's a, a view of the garment as it looks on a display form. Uh, and it has some of my characteristic techniques, uh, a use of a variety of textiles, including kind of quilt fabrics, kind of simple cotton print, uh, use of text that's either hand stenciled or embroidered, and a kind of collage of imagery uh, referencing the queer as well as, as the world around us. Uh, when Michael Fellows and Jordan came to my studio to talk about this proposal, originally we were looking at two garments that I had created already, uh, Love Letter to Queer Descendants on the left, which was exhibited at the Wisconsin Museum of Quilt and Fiber Arts and is about to go now to my solo show in the Iridian Gallery in Richmond, Virginia. And this garment that I created in war uh, memorializing those killed in the Pulse Massacre. This actually is a photograph from Vogue magazine. So I actually had actually already met it to Vogue uh, from my activist work at that point. And we looked at these garments and talked a little bit about what it would mean to create something, uh, a gala elevated version of these kind of works. Uh, I got this nice invitation from Michael, who's the uh, Vogue menswear editor, uh, and the original words that are all the words on the garment came to me in this proposal, uh, Jordan's reflections and thoughtfulness about identity. And I think that this connection that we shared around this idea of, of identity, queer identity, gender identity, and the questions of how clothing expresses or conceals that identity work uh, became kind of the foundation for our relationship and our work together. Initially, I was sure they wouldn't choose me. Uh, so I started into this proposal process and just thought, this is a great opportunity. And when I don't get picked, I won't feel bad because this is such an exciting opportunity to get to know people. Uh, but it was also a very intense process, right? So I went from my own sketches to having um, professional renderings done. I started to do some sample treatments to be able to show what my work would look like. Uh, we went through a number of different silhouettes, including this sort of weird hood thing that eventually we disposed of. Thank goodness, I kept sort of worrying about how it would stand up. Uh, and in the end, uh, settled on a much more um, coat cape-like shape that would give me more surface. You'll notice that still in the renderings, the cape uh, back part is not as long as it, as it ends up being in the final version. I did, again, I, I developed my work in pieces. So here are some early samples on the right are things that turned out to be part of the sleeves and a central detail uh, that I worked on. I actually went back and took photographs 
at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, which I had briefly worked at in 1990 as in the retail and used to go sketch on my lunch break. And these are photos of statues that I used to sketch at, you know, at that moment that I, knowing the garment would walk back in the door of the Metropolitan Museum of Art, I went and took my own photographs and then had them uh, transferred onto fabric to be able to use as imagery. I love this idea that my work would kind of walk back in the door again. Uh, one of the great advantages of this project was that the, uh, through Vogue and Michael, um, Bill Ball, the dressmaker, uh, was uh, assigned to the project to work with me. And Bill did the pattern work as well as supervised all of the fittings and alterations uh, and was a real uh, both uh, role model and mentor and guide and protector and a tremendous, tremendous fashion talent to be able to work with. Uh, and he kept reminding me to just do me and he would make sure that it, it fulfilled all of the requirements of a kind of a more formal wear project. I'd obviously never thought of myself as someone who would be making uh, gala clothing, uh, but was really a special relationship and, and a lot of gratitude for uh, that work with him. Here uh, on the left is a fitting as the garment is starting to reach its fruition. And on the right, a superstar text message from Michael Anna Wintour saw our fitting pics and she said the outfit looks great. You know, the kind of text message that like anybody would want to receive uh, working in this industry. Uh, very exciting. Uh, I, a great team of people worked on this project uh, from stylist and uh, from Bill and, and uh, hair and makeup, uh, my own team, uh, Kim Griffin, who joined me on this project and who has gone on to be someone that works with me quite closely now in terms of pattern making uh, and construction support regularly, uh, and uh, Ashley Kong, who did the, um, the renderings as well. Here's a photo of me. You'll, you'll remember that in the summer of 2021, we're still really masked. And uh, so everyone who came to work in my studio, we, you know, we worked for hours, you know, masked and in this space. That's this is my basement studio. I'm calling in from you today, uh, and uh, and you can see how enormous the the bottom of the the construction of the garment is. It all had to be attached by hand. Mm -hmm. uh, here are two really great shots of the construction process. On the left is when the when the fabric finally came my way. So August 7th, the gala is September 13th. I get what's on the left side. And basically a month later, it's entirely covered in hand textile work on the right side. I, I will, I often joke, it was a very Rumpelstiltskin summer. We just kept spinning gold and spinning gold and spinning gold. Uh, but this is really a, an experience of, um, I didn't know I could do this until I was doing it. And now it's really changed, it's changed my life in terms of the kind of work that I'm making. Uh, it was a great opportunity to uh, be involved in the photo shoot right before the gala uh, came, opened. Uh, Mac Premo did this um, beautiful video, which is actually in part of the display at MAD right now. There's a, a monitor at the base of the display that shows this promotional video that, um, that Mac did for Jordan. The hair is different in the end. This was a, a hairstyle that I, that I liked, but didn't make it to the final cut. Here I am at the Mark Hotel doing some hand work, not because the garment wasn't finished, but I think of my clothing often as a kind of a living garment. So I went to the Mark Hotel while Jordan was getting ready and continued to sort of add my hand touches, you know, sequins and a little bit more stitch work right to the very moment where we put the garment on Jordan to walk out the door. Uh, it was very special to be able to be there uh, over the hours of getting ready. Here's a close up on the left, one of my favorite details. I often use art history in a way that I think of as sort of queering, uh, adding my own kind of wig and decorative de elements to the figure, uh, and a great close up of where that piece shows on the very back of the garment in the, on the right. Uh, Jordan is very tall. Uh, even without the five inch Rick Owens heels uh, uh, they're wearing in, the, in this photo. So you can see me, I'm 5'10 on the left uh, with the garment at the height that it look, is when Jordan is wearing it. Uh, and on the right, this is my photo of Jordan as he's getting ready to head off in the Mark Hotel to go to the gala. And uh, you know, he kind of got in the car and I thought to myself, wow, that was so exciting. And I was a bit underprepared for 
on the kind of the fashion moment that was about to arrive in my newsfeed, which is that maybe half an hour later, the photo started to show up. Uh, Jordan never fails to dazzle at the Met Gala. He wears Michael Sylvan Robinson, the wonderful photo from Vanity Fair of Jordan and his husband, Richie Jackson. Uh, New York Times photo of Jennifer Hudson reaching out to Jordan on the left. On the right, maybe a week later, one of my favorite things that happened as you're a New Yorker, you know that if you show up in the New Yorker uh, cartoon, you've really hit real New York culture moment. Finally, it's amazing Technicolor dream coat weather with a clear depiction of Jordan in my, in my garment. Uh, the, on the left, the French Vogue. And then I got a great invitation. This is uh, one, if you would like to hear more uh, after today, I, I definitely would send people off to the dressed podcast that I did with that one uh, dress podcast is a phenomenal resource for anyone who loves clothing or fashion. And I got to do this great um, interview with them, the art and activism of dress. They're big Jordan Roths fans. So I had shown up on their podcast uh, earlier and then got this invitation. It was really a special experience. So a little bit about how this giant garment kind of fits in with the work that I make in general. Um, and I think that one of the things that um, Elisa and I will talk about, especially the Q&A a little bit, is this idea of the, of the use of the decorative uh, as an invitation for a viewer to engage with my work in a more, in a more um, attentive way. So beauty, decorative elements are uh, like an enticement to look at the messaging. Um, as a queer activist, my work is often really slogan focused, right? So you want to be able to read it and it needs to show up in the photograph. When I work with Jordan, Jordan reminded me that, uh, that we were sort of using activist techniques and street art, but that he was hoping it would be more of an invitation than a signpost or a slogan in that regard. And I think it's been a kind of interesting to hold those ideas of how text use, text and work, uh, which is a common element for me is used. Uh, here, this is a garment I actually wore to the Machine Dazzle opening at MAD uh, and, and have a great photo. The photograph from our promotional for the textile talk has me wearing this garment with Elisa in the photo. Um, what is next must be built together. Here's a, a very large sculptural piece, so not wearable. These are two jackets joined together at the sleeve. I call this piece Composting Our Fears and Committing to Action. It began as a community engaged project at Textile Arts Center when I was in residency. And all of the text was shared to me by people who came to participate in my workshop. So on the left, that jacket has the fears written on the outside and the commitments to action on the inside of the garment. And on the right, the commitments to action are on the outside and the fears are on the inside. And I think of this as kind of like a Janus figure, you know, it's looking in two directions at the same time. Uh, this piece is shown uh, in a couple of different places, but it's, it's about to be showing in New York uh, in a special fiber art show from Bravin, Bravin Lee programs starting in April. Uh, so just around the corner, that'll be up in New York for viewing. I'll mention that I'm gonna be offering a couple of workshop sessions at MAD and using the same kind of community engaged idea for a special project that begins as part of my workshop at MAD. So stay tuned for Queer Pride, Sylvan workshop times at MAD uh, coming soon. And we'll be doing this kind of project, uh, a different silhouette, but this idea of a community engaged text street art project. One of the big categories of work that I use garments to, to express activism, both as art and as, as action, uh, is a series of memorial garments for people killed by gun violence in the United States. Uh, this garment on the right, which we'll see more in close-ups, is the newest one. It's the third of three, year, three annual garments I've made. We honor and remember the 47, 47, 47 452 killed by gun violence in the U.S. in 2022. Uh, this garment includes text details uh, as well as um, statistics. Um, one statistic could be that um, 16 and a half million guns were bought in 2022 alone by Americans. Uh, 27, uh, 38 people committed suicide by guns in that same year. Uh, and these are really shocking numbers that are hard to kind of uh, envision. I use um, 
my research for Gays Against Guns, which is a nonviolent direct action group uh, to, to show up on these garments. And then sometimes they're worn in street action. They all have also been exhibited. And uh, this particular um, garment is about to go to Virginia for the Iridian show. Here's a front and back view. Um, the front, obviously, with the with the prominent use of the the figure, and then the skirt holds all of these different names of people that I'd researched that Gag had held uh, placards for in memorial vigils. Um, and recently, so sometimes it's shown on the body or in a form. This is another one of the garments from uh, 2021. Uh, which is, um, and the placards on the wall when they showed it at Richmond, th these would be the kind of placards that the activists of GAG hold in silence. So one placard per person. And in the exhibit, this idea of the missing person is evident both because the garment doesn't have someone in it, as well as the photos of the people who aren't with us anymore as a result of the gun violence. Uh, that's really an epidemic in this country. I do work sculpturally as well. Here are two newer sculptures on the left, uh, I, I have a series of busts that have sort of been inspired uh, by my time recently visiting Rome uh, and Pompeii, thinking about the sort of the fragments of an empire. Uh, and then again, kind of querying these found broken pieces as a way of sort of restoring them or re-energizing them. On the right, uh, I, I call this series, My Mystic Hands. Those are also gonna be shown in New York uh, at Brevin Lee this spring as well. Uh, I, uh, this will show up in a moment as we talk about the outfit that I'm making for Jordan to wear to the mad opening, but I've recently started taking the bust and, and using them in a 2D form, working kind of sculpturally, but in a flat surface way. Uh, these are both wor larger works that are, are framed, uh, both available at the camp gallery where I'm represented. So because with this wonderful opening for the MAD event coming our way, uh, I've been able to work with Jordan on a new piece. Uh, and so on the left is my, uh, my rendering, my sketch. I wanted to work on something that was kind of a 60s socialite silhouette, but then really kind of up the lux of the queer textile work that I do. Um, I'm working with, a, again, a great team. Uh, Jordan Stylist, Alvin Roger, uh, Thomas and Michael, and then uh, uh, been introduced to a new um, uh, pattern maker, dressmaker, uh, Estelle, who has been great and, and worked on getting the toile all set to the right that you see, uh, and my own studio assistant, Claire, who did a lot of detailed handwork for me. So I'm not going to show you much more. I'm just going to show you one more photo of what the back of the cape looks like. It, it, uh, the final fitting is tomorrow, so there's no there's no photo shoot of Jordan and the outfit yet. But here is the uh, the back of the garment, and you can see how this really comes out of that work that I've been doing around uh, the faces. Uh, in fact, actually, the face in the middle of the cape is the same face that I used in the 2D work later on. Um, and, and I think that one of the things that I've been thinking a lot about in, in this project and, the, and in this series is a whole, you know, as someone whose work both includes free activism, service and care of others, and some very high end art, you know, shown at museums and galleries, I'm often thinking about so much of the art history that we study uh, is a, um, are the in legacies of a very high economic value for that craft, for that art. Uh, when you're walking around and seeing the, the the you know things that came out of Pompeii or uh, you know the um, the patronage of the Renaissance you know that the level of craftsmanship uh, had an enormous investment structure uh, and I think I sit so somewhat uneasily in this sort of back and forthness I, I, one of the things that I will often share is that you know at the same time that my work was being worn at the Met Gala. You know, I had friends protesting the Met Gala, and I and I think those are really valid things to hold, kind of in a in an alchemy. I would have been disappointed if my friends hadn't been protesting, but that doesn't mean that having my garment walk into that space wasn't its own way of making um, messaging that was very much about um, queer identity and visibility. Um, but I do hold a bit of this sort of. Um, uh, the alchemy can feel sometimes a little uncomfortable. Uh, and I think that in this 
this garment in particular, I'm thinking a lot about, um, you know, the beauty of craft and sculpture and the fragility of our society at this particular moment, uh, the sort of like cityscape and sunset, uh, the, with, again, these figures that have been um, decoratively queered. The uh, installation at MAD is really exquisite. I can't say enough about how great it's been to work with the MAD team. Uh, you'll see, so this is the, the view of the lobby. Uh, to the left is the garment, uh, and they've sort of built this wonderful uh, tiered, so it has the same sense of, of Jordan going up the stairs. Uh, it's got some great lighting that helps keep the sparkle alive. And then uh, they've uh, created this wallpaper uh, from a collage of all of the imagery that then is wrapped around the elevator entrance area. Obviously, this is going to be a great selfie area. I'm looking forward to seeing what 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 uh, what people do when they can take their photos in front of these details. And it really provides an opportunity to see the handwork and the decorative collage elements at a scale that you can kind of get right up to and look at closely. Uh, I, I haven't seen this yet, so this is the rendering, but I, I will say that you know, for me, the idea that my that my handwork, this collage stuff, is going to be uh, on the wall at such a scale is something that I know is is quite inspiring and moving for me, and also provides people a chance to sort of really see the details in that regard. Uh, and then it wraps around. I love here. I love that the sequined text weaving and unraveling it. It's sort of wrapping this corner uh, with the eye there, and. Uh, Lisa, do you want to say anything about the, the installation? Well, yeah, I mean, first of all, the coat is up. Um, that happened last week. Um, it was an extended, very delicate process um, to get the coat on the mannequin and situated in the proper way. And Sylvan was there to oversee it all. We had a dresser also um, who works with a, a lot of the big costume shows in New York City who was there to help. It looks fantastic. Um, it does have, so when you mentioned the wonderful lighting effect, so the, um, there's like these, these, uh, fluorescent colored fluorescent bars that give off this, um, kind of psychedelic light that, uh, and kind of reminds you of the glamour of the red, um, carpeted entryway and the staircase that, that Jordan walked up. And of course, this is a coat that can only be worn on a staircase, um, and so we wanted to show it from the back. And then there's a mirror on the wall that allows you to see the detailing on the front as well. The wallpaper, the vinyl goes up, um, I think this week, it's obviously gonna be up before the opening. And I have not seen um, the test prints, but I know it's gonna be incredible. It's gonna look fantastic. And it's gonna be really, um, I think just a whole new way of looking at the coat on a macro level, right? Like there's a micro and a macro experience when you're looking at the, the details on the coat um, close up and then you've got this magnification of those same details um, that allow you to see something else about the, the textiles and the sewing and the, the beading, et cetera. Those are gonna look fantastic. Here's a, here's a photo uh, from the installation day that Lisa was just talking about. Um, the team was really incredible. Uh, I, I think that the lighting, and you'll also see that there's the monitor with, with Max video uh, mm -hmm. that shows the garment moving and Jordan uh, and some of the words that, that Jordan uh, included as part of the reflection. I mean, I think overall, one of the things that I, this project changed my life. There's no doubt about it. I was able to do things I'd never managed or imagined I could do. Um, it's changed the way that I work in general, this idea of uh, really understanding how 2D sculpture and clothing all work together for me in kind of a thematic exploration. There are things that uh, a garment being worn by somebody versus a garment on a hanger or a garment on a form uh, say different things. And I think there are values to all of that. Uh, and then this opportunity to have this work shared with at MAD, a, a museum that I'm such a big fan of, and I've had, uh, you know, so many friends uh, have their work exhibited there. It's, it's really a tremendous opportunity. Uh, and I'm excited about having, you know, an opportunity to share workshops and to have uh, MAD, MAD opportunities to participate more with the kind of work that I like to do, particularly connected to queer activism. And uh, I think that one of the things that 
I will say that as someone who is a lifelong educator, arts educator as well, I think that there's always a lot of learning embedded in my work and my own research and my own learning. And there's often an opportunity for the viewer or the participant to also do their own learning reflection or investigation as well. And I think that the lobby installation really provides that opportunity for people to look and to think about identity and, and reflect on these ideas of, of gender and art history, uh, both in the decorative elements on the surface of the garment, as well as on the wallpaper uh, blown up to a larger size. Um, mm -hmm. But th there's no doubt that this project uh, changed the way that I get to work in the world. Uh, and I'm really grateful for the opportunity to talk about it more today, the textile talk, uh, but also for the many, many viewers who will get a chance to experience this special garment at MAD. Obviously a, a really, really big uh, gratitude for Jordan for having uh, taken this um, uh, good faith effort to bring me uh, a project like this and for also for the loan of the garment uh, to MAD as well. Uh, yeah, we're and, very yeah, grateful to Jordan um, being open to uh, exhibiting this piece. So I think that's it from the presentation share part. And then we've gotten, uh, we have plenty of time for questions and answer. And, and Elisa and I will uh, try to kind of uh, make this conversationally as well between us. Uh, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen so I can kind of uh, look at the questions as well. I had one quick question. Um, Sylvan, you mentioned that the, the piece really changed your practice. Are, do you mean, because you have worked with themes and thematic um, thematics for the clothing, um, for your clothing before, are you talking about because of the scale of this piece, like you really had to think about this in, at, at a size um, that you had never considered before in terms of carrying through the theme? Yeah, I think I think it's a couple of things, one of which is definitely scale. I mean, it's like seven feet, the train is like seven feet. Uh, I, uh, so the enormity of it. I also think that one of the things that's been kind of exciting for me, uh, both working with Bill Ball and Estelle as well, is this idea of having a chance to work with real, real clothing masters uh, mm -hmm. on pattern work and alterations and to sort of bring some of my street art uh, I mean, I do horrible things with my sewing machine. You know, I'm, I'm running my sewing machine over all kinds of layers of things. Um, but I think that up until the Met Gala commission came my way, I, I don't know that I would have done that wrong of collaborative work. Uh, and I, I mentioned Kim Griffin, a costume designer that I work with regularly on uh, on sort of my activist clothes, making some, she, you know, made a pattern for me for the, uh, my own outfit for Gaze Against uh, Guns, as well as for the opening for MAD. So I think there's a way in which this project has also brought this idea that uh, collaboration and, and the costume and fashion people in New York in particular that I can get a chance to work with have really broadened my ability to do more as well. Yeah, you were able to really tap into a professional network of people that are often behind the scenes, like Bill Bull. I mean, what a fascinating person and career. Um, make, you know, as a pattern maker and a tailor, uh, there's just a wealth of individuals like that still working in New York on handmade garments. We forget about that. I love one of the questions that I saw was whether there would be head pieces. And I think this is definitely one of those moments where, um, you know, I'm, as a big machine dazzle fan, you know, when I think of head pieces, I immediately go to the extravagant and gorgeous assemblages that are machine dazzle uh, head pieces. I of course dress my own self with a with a hat, and so I am actually have been making my this one I didn't make, but I, I have been making my own hats to go with my outfits. Supposedly there'll be a hat that I'm wearing at the mad opening next week, but I haven't started it yet, so uh, I'm not entirely sure. But I like the idea that hats might be a way for me to go um, in terms of adding to the outfit. Um, mm -hmm. There's also um, a couple of questions here about the idea of using the decorative to engage an audience. Um, and maybe we could talk a little bit more about that. Um, maybe first of all, uh, what, your, what, what do you mean by the decorative um, and how do you want to use it exactly? Mm. Yeah, I, I mean, it's interesting, especially being at MAD, you know, early, early on in my art practice, decorative and craft are things that were often used as a pejorative term. 
right? These were not things that meant that one's work was going to go in a museum this was, or in a gallery. This was work that was uh, sort of being written off by those terms. And I, you know, when someone kind of gives me that kind of, maybe it's because I, as a queer person, I often I have, have responded to that idea of exclusionary or um, gatekeeping in a way that just makes me bolder and more wanting to kind of go in my own way. Uh, so, you know, I use decorative and craft. I, I, one of the greatest groups of people who, who often love my work are quilt makers. I'm not a quilt maker myself, but I know that I use quilt fabrics and quilt techniques regularly and that quilt makers see that in my work. Uh, and often, uh, particularly in that, that most recent anti-gun violence garment, uh, almost all the fabric have been provided by um, people who were giving me quilt pieces their aunts had made or, or family members had. And I, I deliberately used the sort of red, white, and blue Americana print work uh, to then to obviously make that statement that also this is a, a, the gun violence in America is a uniquely American kind of um, concern. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that some of the things that I think about sometimes around my use of, of decorative materials, I love sequins. I wish they weren't so terrible in terms of what they're made out of. I can't quite get, I can't, they're kind of like one of the things I just can't kind of give up. I do sometimes use repurposed uh, garments and kind of um, Frankenstein the sequins out of things that already existed. But I will say that I have a real eye for the color palette that I want and the kind of sequins that I like. Um, again, it's one of the advantages of being in New York that obviously the fashion district still has all these wonderful places to go and um, find special glittery, glittery, um, dazzling things. Um, I love to go to, you know, to Matt, uh, to, um, to Mood and look at all the, all the trims and the, and the sparkly fabrics. Um, you know, I think that uh, when I was a costume designer in the 90s, uh, people would often say like, you know, it's always so pattern on pattern on pattern for you. And I, as a result of making clothing and making art for myself and for art, I know I no longer have to sort of face that challenge, right? Like no one is saying to me, please make something more minimalist, right? If you, and I used to say to people sometimes around costume design, I have a great person to recommend for you. I'm really not the minimalist here. That's not good. I'm not the right designer for you for this project. I can do it, but you know, there'd be a person who's more in that spirit of that. Yeah. Well, I mean, you're right. For historically, the term, terms craft and the decorative have been used to exclude a wide, wide range of artists and different techniques, right? So I do see you as part of a really important generation, two or three generations at this point, beginning with feminist artists who kind of uh, recouped that term craft, and then uh, many, many queer artists who began to um, take back the term the decorative, right? Um, and understand it's uh, understand the way that it excluded artists. Um, and deflate its power by just um, embracing maximalism and also not being afraid of beauty and sumptuousness. You know, uh, absolutely. And I think that because I come from a kind of a street activist um, background, you know, some of the questions that I've seen in the Q and A around, you know, hemline and uh, the kind of the chaos or the freehandness uh, mm -hmm. are, are things that. I mean, it's really interesting where I, this garment that I'm working on uh, right now for Jordan to wear the opening, you know, has to have a level of finish that is a, a real fashion finish. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a, a, a match and a challenge about working in that, in that terrain for me, uh, because on my own, all the threads are going to be dangling. I don't mind if things are a little bumpy. In fact, if they're bumpy, it's probably because I've, I've layered six different things on top of it. I think about texture more, almost um, almost like archaeology, right? Like it's almost like the layers of painted, like if you're a New Yorker and you've lived in an apartment that's been repainted 16 times, right? There's a way that all those histories kind of layer on top of each other. Um, so there's, there's a bit of a challenge for me to be able to, to work in, in that high-end clothing category that obviously the Met Gala demanded, but in some ways, even more so this garment that I'm making for the opening, which is being worn on a much more intimate or smaller scale uh, and, and, and viewed in a much closer up way. I think that one of the things that was exciting about the Met Gala opportunity uh, 
uh, was that every time I tried to kind of go more into more typical terrain, mm -hmm. Jordan would say, we didn't pick you for that. <laughs> that is not what, if I had wanted that, I would have asked somebody else. We want you to do the most magnificent thing that only you can do. Yeah, um, but that's I, hard because you're you're also saying that you must have or, or achieve a level of finish that is acceptable within these particular fashion contexts. So to stay you, which is very improvisational or um, maybe a little rough around the edges because it because you like that edge, um, that's pretty that's pretty difficult. I still think you see it in the coat, though. I really do. Yeah. I think that my initial uh, fear was that things would fall off the coat at the yeah. gala, and it and it really didn't. But I also will say that uh, my studio at home is in my basement, but I often photograph, I often photograph things up in a small smaller attic space, and so I was just dragging that thing up and down the stairs uh, in a way that I also knew it would then make it the whole night without um, having anything fall off of it. Yeah. I will say that when it came to Mad. And I got to see it for the first time since it walked out the door on Jordan to the gala. Uh, I did find a couple of pins that I had missed <laughs> in the process. They were still there. They were still there. They're not there anymore because I removed them <laughs> when I got to come and do a little bit of repairs. But obviously Jordan wore it without without uh, a moment of, of um, revealing that, that if he had been picked, uh, picked by a pin, he didn't let on, that's for sure. Uh, mm -hmm. There's a couple of housekeeping questions. Um, whether the garment's going to tour and how long it's at MAD. It won't tour. It can be up for just a small amount of time because of the delicacy of the fabrics. And we do have this in our uh, newly designed uh, lobby gallery or atrium gallery, which is more difficult to control the, the climate and the light um, in those that area. So it is up, I think June 30th is the last day and it will go back into storage and take a rest. So if anyone's available or in New York or is planning on traveling to New York, get here before June 30th and you can see it. I think that uh, I know I always love a textile talk because it's the audience that will absolutely ask questions about materials and, mm -hmm. and techniques. And you know, not often with an artist talk, those things don't really come your way all the time. Uh, I do work primarily in basic you know, quilt cotton. Uh, most of my work is printed onto that. And then I kind of collage in these higher end fabrics from the, from the garment district or that people give me as well. Uh, I know that I'm gonna do some really rough things to fabric. So I think that one of the reasons why I stay in that kind of quilt fabric category is because I know it will handle what I need to be able to do to it. Uh, it is typical for me to, if I'm working with someone on the pattern making or construction support, I tend to work in a two-dimensional form first. So pieces are cut and then given to me, and then I collage and do an initial round of beading and embellishment. Uh, and then they go back to go then be uh, joined together and have a lining put in. Then they come back to me to kind of do some final last embellishments uh, to look at things that now in a three-dimensional garment, I might have missed in terms of that work. That's what's going to happen over the next, over this weekend for the outfit that I'm making for Jordan for next week. Uh, and I I value that back and forth. Uh, I do think that there's a way in which uh, when I'm making clothing that's either going to be sculptural or worn just by me for activism, I often you know things aren't lined or I'm not as worried about those things. Sometimes I do some repurposing of things as well, kind of Frankensteining uh, found objects or or things into a, a created garment. Uh, but primarily I, I the garment that Jordan is wearing for next week is already at like a hundred hours of handwork. Mm -hmm. uh, and then that gala garment was really six eight solid weeks of handwork from my own hand and a number of other hands. I and mean, we were definitely sewing 10, 12 hours a day to, to be able to attach all of that by hand. Uh, and I and I really, val I think one of the things that's so, I really value the hand labor. And that's really when it comes down to it, I think that my main uh, value is that handwork. And the idea that you can do some very interesting things, maybe if you are willing to go outside of the lines a little bit or to join things. I think it's one of the reasons why I'm such a big fan of Machine Dazzle's work because in some ways we're kind of, we're kind of cousins. Yeah, you um, are. Although my work is all attached in this sort of 
you know, uh, fashion, clothing. Uh, there's no hot glue. <laughs> Yours has a level of finish that he has no interest in achieving. <laughs> Uh, and yet there's ways in which I think that, it, and we've done some of the same activist work and we're both people yeah. who work with gays against guns. Um, so for me, there's a way in which that kind of conversation is so big that includes both of us in our own unique ways. Very, yeah, very. Let me see here. Let's look at the, um, you do mention the upcoming exhibition in New York City. Anything else on the horizon? There's a question here from Tim Tate about possibly working at the Smithsonian or the Renwick, wouldn't that be nice? Um, <laughs> I, I would love to be invited for sure. And I, I will get, I'm gonna give Tim Tate a shout out. When I lived in Baltimore, uh, I, and I was a young fiber artist, I went uh, to, to visit with Tim, who's a, a, an exceptional queer glass artist. And Tim gave me two pieces of advice that I have never looked back on without taking into account. And the first one was, you absolutely must start having your work professionally photographed, uh, mm -hmm. which was totally true. Uh, and two, use the most luxe materials that you can currently use and afford in your practice. Uh, and obviously the Met Gala project blew what was possible for me in terms of the luxe of materials. I, I mean, I went and bought lace trims and beaded things that I have, you know, kind of like, you know, obsessively looked at at mood for years and years and just thought, oh my goodness, I couldn't possibly buy a half yard of that. Uh, and I, I use those things sometimes like saffron, like a little bit goes a long way for me. Yeah. Um, and the other one, I, other person I want to give a shout out to um, is anyone who's given me materials, uh, you know, sent me uh, family uh, scraps of, of ancestral, you know, quilts or garments or things like that. Those things, uh, uh, I have a work colleague who just gave me her mother's needle points um, that haven't yet shown up in a work, but I'm sure at some point I'll deconstruct them and use them in a very textural way. Wonderful. Okay, I think we have time for one more question. And I, I'm, this, I'm curious about this too. How much does it weigh? <laughs> <laughs> well, Jordan swore that it was not the heaviest thing he's ever worn, which I totally get. Uh, and, uh, and, and then after the, the gala, after me, he was wearing this ex exquisite kind of dark Tom Brown outfit that was, you know, just, you know, had this sort of like whole transformational level. Um, it's very heavy. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think that, uh, Bill structured it so that the garment has a kind of a built-in harness under the surface. So like the, the jacket would never pull open and Jordan wouldn't be being pulled from the shoulders. It's it's basically like this harness that means that all the weight is being pulled from Jordan's center and it's mm -hmm. all really strapped down under the garment. So the jacket looks like it's open, but it, it, it actually won't open up any further. And that gave him an ability to kind of move. Jordan wore it all night. I know that sometimes at the gala, people have a outfit they wear for the red carpet and then they change into something simpler. Jordan wore it the, all, the whole night. Uh, and it does some interesting things in movement and in and it kind of bunches, it bunches interestingly uh, in ways where like things that used to be on opposite sides of the train then suddenly are together in a new way. And actually the wallpaper at, at MAD does a kind of a similar thing. It brings elements that were further apart and puts them next to each other in relationship in a way that I think is really one of the main points of the, of the garment as well. Yeah, we recollaged your collage. <laughs> well, thank you. This was a really wonderful conversation. And I have a feeling that Astrid would like to get back on and um, close us out. Whoops, yes. Well, this was fascinating. You know, it's it's just amazing to hear the details. I've been watching this unfold on Instagram and through discussions elsewhere, but to hear the more of the details is is just been really fantastic. Thank you, Sylvan. Thank you, Elisa, so much for doing this for us today. Um, anyway, I want to thank our sponsors as well. The recording of this will be available on the YouTube Textile Talk playlist in the next week and also on SDA's website. Uh, next Wednesday, Textile Talk hosts Spiritual Technology, the work of Basil Kincaid, sponsored by the International Quilt Museum. And also I wanna give a shout out for Elisa Authors, Elisa Authors' talk 
Uh, she'll do another textile talk on May 1st, centered on the Museum of Art and Design um, uh, exhibition there. Um, thank you all for attending and thanks to our sponsors and to all of you who do so for support of Textile Talks programming. Thank Happy spring. You. Bye.